So welcome everyone to the second meeting of the winter quarter. Um, and today we are hosting Mary Hathunle, um, who we will introduce after talking about the rules first, because we need to set things straight. So um, before anything, we want to let you remind you to please respect the officers and guest speakers during this meeting by muting yourself while we're speaking by using appropriate language in the call and chat and being polite to everyone. And since we do have um, a guest speaker with uh, an MD degree, please do not ask diagnostic questions. This is just, we're just doing a Q and A, not diagnostic question. Okay, um, and any members who do not respect these rules will be kicked out of this meeting. And this meeting is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So if you're not be comfortable with being on our YouTube channel, please save these questions and um, send it to us and let us know. And yeah. So Manuel. Oh, um, here's like a brief overview of today's agenda. So we're gonna start with the just simple guidelines and then from 410 to 440, uh, the presentation of, for by Dr. Mary, and then a, a Q and A for around thirty minutes after that, and yep. Yeah. And very quickly, uh, we have a new addition in our office team, Paul, who just talked. So yeah. Additionally, we wanted to remind everyone of our um, attendance system. So you can earn a maximum of two points one by signing in. In the beginning, and we'll be signing out. So right now, I'll paste it in the chat. And if you can't attend the live, you can earn an extra. Additionally, our members can earn extra points through um, community service or Kahoot. And today, we'll be, we won't be conducting a Kahoot, but we found in the uh, link below. So let me go ahead and paste it. Uh, so for our tentative events, the meeting today will be with our special guest speaker, Dr. Kunle from UCSF. Um, it means a lot for, to us that you're um, taking time out of your day to speak to everyone. And for our next um, guest speaker event will um, be Dr. Woolrich, who is also a UCSF physician. And for the next one will be um, Seth Suzuki, who is a PA student right now. And he is a former De Enzo student as well. Oh, and then here's like a spreadsheet of, here, I'll put in the chat of just, very like a large quantity of like resources in the pre-health pre-med uh, area. Uh, so these are ways that you can get connected with us. Um, we have our Instagram, our email, and our YouTube channel. And if you want to join our Discord or emailing list, um, those are the QR codes. So we'll give you guys time to just scan them. It'll also be placed it in the chat. So we're gonna move on. Yeah, and an overview of the agenda that we're gonna be covering today. So today we're going to introduce a little bit about um, schooling medicine for Mary, as well as talking about her in years of medical school and residency as well as giving tips and encouraging words at the end. So let's start with introducing our guest speaker. So our guest speaker for today, like we mentioned before, is Mary Kunle. And um, she has a, a bachelor's degree and, it, and an MD degree, and is currently a urology resident at the University of San Francisco, California, and she could talk more about this in here. I'll pass on to you. 
Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see all of your faces and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. I'm very happy to kind of talk about what I do and offer words of encouragement. Um, so yeah, I'm a urology resident at UCSF. I'm in my fifth year. Uh, it's a six-year program, so almost done. Um, but a little bit about me, I'm, you know, originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I have, you know, a lot of interest. I have a lot of plants in my apartment. I think some are, are peeking behind me. <laughs> um, I'm also a singer and uh, really enjoy wine tasting, which has been great uh, since being in California near Napa and Sonoma and all that stuff. Um, that is my social media. So feel free to um, reach out on there or in any way. Um, if you want to keep in touch, very happy to keep in touch with everyone. Uh, so these are just some <laughs> pictures from medical school, mostly from the end of medical school uh, graduation. Um, that's my entire class that's in the bottom right corner on our match day. Um, and just, you know, it was a it was a good time, a good four years. So, you know, go into some more of that later, but just some pictures. Um, so my undergrad, um, so I did um, um, undergrad at Gettysburg College, which is in Pennsylvania. It's a, a small liberal arts college, um, which was, you know, which was a great option for me. I think I wanted to go to a smaller college as opposed to my brother who went to University of Maryland, which is humongous. Um, so smaller was better for me, um, you know, did biology major, neuroscience minor, pre-med track, um, graduated in 2012. And during my time there was very involved. I was a tour guide for the college. I was in an acapella group. I did rugby. I was in a sorority. So, you know, lots of ways to kind of beef up the resume, so to speak, but also had a lot of fun. Um, that's a picture for my graduation. I always joke that like my parents don't like look happy at all. I'm assuming they were happy that I graduated from college, but I was the only one smiling apparently. Um, and then after college, I took two years off um, to take the MCAT and to uh, do some research. So I uh, was a part of the NIH post -back program um, and was at a program in Baltimore. So I got some of that experience from there. And uh, just some more pictures um, of me operating on the right uh, with Dr. McInidge, who is a, you know, huge, huge uh, figure in the urology world. Um, and a picture from my brother's graduation when he got his PhD and some of my co-residents is the bottom left. So happy times, you know, in medicine. <laughs> Um, and then just sort of my medical school pathway. So uh, I went to Rutgers, uh, New Jersey Medical School um, for it was a four year, you know, track as all of medical school is um, it was located in Newark, New Jersey, which for me was great because it was uh, tailored to an underserved population. Um, I graduated in 2018 and then moved over here to California my first time on the West Coast uh, to start urology residency six year program currently in my fifth year, which is my research year. Um, and I'll go into kind of each of the steps a little bit more later, but this is just kind of my overview of my pathway. Um, okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. So I made a little urology presentation um, that I will share with everyone. Let me go back to the top. I think most people um, don't always have a good idea of what urology even is. And I always say that's that's kind of a good thing because, <laughs> you know, if you've seen the urologists, you know, uh, it, maybe there's some issues, but um, I'll explain what it is and maybe garner some interest in people. Maybe there's some future urologists in the crowd. So what is urology? So I went over this already from Baltimore, currently in San Francisco. Um, residency came out here in 2018, will graduate in 2024. And then my plans are to do a two-year um, oncology fellowship. So I'm gonna focus on cancers in urology for, for two years of, um, do two years of training for that. Um, so this is kind of a, a nice sort of schematic of what urology is, why urology. This is from the AUA, the American Urologic Association. 
Um, your urology, just, you know, the definition, it is uh, a surgical med and medical management of the uh, genital urinary tract. So all of the organs that are involved in the urinary system, um, and then we also deal with um, the genital organs of both male and female. We're kind of the counterparts of OBGYN, which is what I say sometimes. We're the counterpart of um, nephrologists, which are kidney doctors. We're the kidney surgeons. So we kind of, we have a lot of other doctors uh, that we work with and counterparts and things like that. But um, these are just some of the popular reasons why people go into urology. I think the biggest things are you are not just operating or being a surgeon, you're also managing patients with medicine. So I think sometimes the stereotype of a surgeon is that they just want to operate all the time. And while I do love operating, if somebody can be managed with medications, we will try that first. So it's really nice to do both of those um, for patients. Um, it's a good work-life balance. I think that's really appealing to a lot of um medical students when they're deciding. Uh, med school is hard. Undergrad is hard. What you guys is, is doing is hard. And you want to get to a point in your life where you can live your life even while being a doctor. So urologists have the option of, you know, operating all the time if they want or operating only some of the time and doing more stuff in the clinic. So it's a really great balance and you can make it what you want. Um, there's always a need for urologists, especially in more rural areas. Um, so it's it's one of those jobs, like most of medicine, where you know that you will have one at the end of the day, at the end of your training. Um, and we just see a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, one patient may know the urologist is their kidney stone doctor. Another patient may know a urologist as their bladder cancer doctor. And it's kind of a whole spectrum. So there's a lot of diversity in the field. Um, which is very nice. So just, I don't know, these are like cute little pictures, but <laughs> we deal with, uh, you know, the kidneys. This is a little picture of the bladder. And then on the right is the prostate. Um, so just some of the organs that we uh, operate on and, and manage medically. So I'll just talk about how I decided urology. I think a lot of people, when they first meet me and they hear urology, they're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> um, so the steps to get me here, like I said, you know, multiple times, I went to Gettysburg College, um, majored in biology, neuroscience minor, pre-med concentration, took two years off after that, um, took the MCAT twice. I did the NIH post back research position so I could just, you know, that, that I will say that NIH position um, still is sort of highlight it to this day. People see that on my my resume and they're like, oh, wow, that's that's really cool because you show that you were involved in research and it's the NIH. So something to keep in the back of your mind if you get to that point where you're looking for things to beef up your application. Um, oops. Uh, so then I went to Rutgers New Jersey Medical School again, that was 2014 to 2018. And, um, you know, in medical school, you do your rotations in the hospital starting your third year, for the most part, other, some med schools are different, but you start to kind of dabble into these different specialties and figure out what you like. And um, I remember thinking as a third year, I, there was no way I was going to be a surgeon. So I got my surgery rotation done out of the way because it wasn't going to happen. And then I rotated through the year and got towards the end of the year and didn't know what I wanted to do and said, uh, hmm, okay, maybe I did like being in the operating room. <laughs> maybe I did like being, you know, seeing surgery. So I decided kind of late in my third year, um, I had some friends who were deciding in urology, they told me to check it out. So I did, I really liked it and kind of quickly jumped on the urology chain and tried to get some research done and talk to people. Um, and then going into my fourth year, which is when you apply for residency, I had to do away rotations where you basically go to different um, medical schools and kind of um, audition, so to speak, as a resident. So I did a bunch of rotations. I um, also thought I was going to stay in the Northeast. So I did my array rotations in New York, Boston, and D.C., <laughs> 
Um, but I, you know, when I interviewed, I uh, got a chance to interview here at UCSF, which is a really great program. It's it's one of the top programs, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I just thought if they gave me a chance to actually train here, then I would definitely take it. And so I ranked them number one and thankfully was able to match here. So, you know, kind of the whole time in med school, I, I thought I knew what I wanted and thought I knew, but you just never know. So another tip along the way is keep your mind open to the possibilities. Um, and now I'm doing my residency. So like I said, at six years, I'm in my fifth year. I'll graduate next year, which I can't believe, but you know, time really does fly. <laughs> Um, so just a little bit about urology residency, um, and I know next, next time you guys do this, you'll talk to a pediatric residence, uh, so that'll be slightly different, um, but for us, you know, there are, I think, 146 programs in the U.S., which, uh, it's definitely one of the smaller residencies, not as many programs, um, it, they range from one to, like, five or six applicants a year, so comparing that to like um, internal medicine, um, they take 60 people a year. I think at UCSF, our program takes now four people a year. So you can imagine how competitive it is. Um, and it's considered one of the most competitive specialties. Um, so in this last cycle, we just had our, our match day um, for the fourth year medical students. And there was an 81% match rate. Um, so 500 applicants for 383 spots, you know, the, the match rate isn't really going to get much higher because there's only so many spots. So um, it's definitely a, a coveted a sort of um, specialty to go into. And so that, you know, puts a little bit of pressure on you in med school, but I will be the first to tell you it is possible if you want to do it. So um, so the things that I sort of was looking for when deciding, um, you know, I wanted there to be diversity and that meant in the faculty that I would be training from and the residents that I would be around and, and learning with, and also the patients probably most importantly. So I mentioned being um, in Newark for med school, uh, which was um, it really did cater to not just the underserved, but kind of like a lot of, of Northern New Jersey, because that's where people would go for specialty care. Um, so I wanted to have that same experience and not just have a, a homogenous group of patients who were all insured and, you know, all a certain, you know, economic class or ethnicity. So that was something that I, I valued. Um, surgical and medical autonomy, which is just, um, you know, getting the chance to sort of flex your doctor skills, so to speak. When you're a resident, you are a doctor and people do treat you that way, but certain programs, you have a bit more freedom than others. So I wanted to be able to kind of flex those skills and get, get a little bit of freedom, you know, safely in the operating room and, and when managing patients. Um, mentorship is huge. So um, I definitely wouldn't be here without mentorship. And I knew that that's what I wanted to have in my residency and, um, and from here on, honestly. So that was a big one. Research opportunities. Um, you know, I, I had some experience with research and wanted to continue that. And so, um, you know, some programs focus on it more than others. UCSF is definitely one where research is huge. Um, and so that was something I valued. And then just plainly, I wanted to be like in a cool city. <laughs> so not every program is in places like San Francisco or New York. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, I had things to do that were fun when I was outside of the hospital. So UCSF Urology, um, it's a six year program. It's in San Francisco. Um, my sort of setup was I did my intern year, which is the first year of residency in the general surgery department, which is a different department. And that um, setup has kind of changed a little bit. Uh, now interns are doing kind of half general surgery, half urology. So they're getting urology exposure earlier. Um, you know, I didn't mind the full year because I made some really good friends in other specialties in general surgery and other surgical specialties. So I thought it was great. And you learn how to take care of surgical patients. Um, so they do a good job of teaching us that. Um, and then there are four clinical urology years. And there's one research year, which I'm doing this year. Um, and we cover five different hospitals. We have our VA, uh, which is 
taking care of veterans. We have Zuckerberg SF General, which is our county hospital. So for patients that are underinsured or uninsured, we have our Mission Bay Hospital, which it takes care of our pediatric and oncology patients. We have our Parnassus Hospital, which is our, our benign pathology. And then we also go to Oakland and take care of um, pediatric population there. So we're, we're pretty spread out, but we get a good diverse exposure with uh, in our training. So um, like I've said a billion times, I'm in my research year now, um, and not all urology programs have a dedicated research year. Most programs are moving away from it, so they'll just have a five-year program without it. Um, I think we're pretty fortunate here at UCSF to still have one because it's kind of a reprieve in the middle of a very busy uh, residency. So um, rather than working the 12 to 14 hours a day that you do as a clinical resident, you're kind of more on a nine to five schedule. So you can kind of take a break and catch up on life. People will get married, have kids, you know, other things that that we want to do at this point in our lives. Um, so for my research year, I am focusing on um, mostly prostate cancer research, and I'm looking at prostate cancer specifically in African-American men. Um, Black men are, you know, more likely to have um, high grade or high risk prostate cancer and the mortality is higher. And, you know, there are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, you know, disparities is a word that comes up a lot. And we know that that's true being, you know, access to care and, you know, a lot of different factors, but I'm also looking into whether there are genetic uh, contributors. So um, I'm a part of the study uh, working with, you know, cells and pipetting and things that maybe you guys are doing. I am doing right now in the lab. Um, and then I'm also doing some clinical research that's, again, looking at prostate cancer and in, in, um, in patients that are on active surveillance. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And, you know, besides my research, I am also catching up on life and, you know, hanging out with friends and traveling and all the things that we all like to do. So next steps for me, um, finishing residency is the first one. <laughs> so I have a like a year and a half or less than a year and a half left, which is kind of crazy. And then, I, like I said, I'm going to do a urologic oncology fellowship, which is another two to three years. Um, I'm going through the process of applying for that and interviewing. So, you know, it, it never quite stops. You're always kind of going to the next step and trying to put your best foot forward. So that's where I'm headed. And then these are just some pictures I found of, uh, you know, us having a good time operating and being with each other and uh, eating ice cream and going out to lunch and all that stuff. So these are just the different teams I've been on. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's feels like a family. You work very closely with people. So you really get to know them. Um, so switching a little bit, just talking about some common urologic things, um, getting back into what urology is. So, um, our most common sort of problems are, um, UTIs, recurrent UTIs in particular, if a patient has them over and over again, which can be, of course, very stressful, they will often be referred to a urologist. Kidney stones, that's probably one of our most common things we deal with, especially globally, um, it, kidney stones, and those can be, you know, we think about it here in the U.S. as kind of being something that we can take care of easily, but it is a cause of a lot of mortality in other places that are uh, more developing countries. Um, hematuria is a big one. So that's just blood in the urine, whether it's blood that you see or blood that's picked up on a test. Um, all of the cancers of the genital urinary system, prostate, kidney, bladder, penile, urethral, it goes on and on. We deal with those, um, lower urinary symptoms. So, um, any sort of urinary issues, if, if someone is peeing too much or, if they feel like they're not peeing enough or if they feel like they're not emptying their bladder, um, we deal with that. And that goes hand in hand with BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. So men, you know, most men, if they live long enough, will have some component of BPH. And so um, traditionally, I think people, if they know urology, they think about us seeing mostly men. Um, and, you know, it's kind of hard to say, because if you think about UTIs and kidney stones and hematuria and cancers, you know, that can happen to women as well. So I don't know that it's 
what the split is, but we do see both men and women in, in treat their conditions. Um, so just talking about kind of a typical patient workup and how we go through it. Um, and, and this is true for, you know, honestly, all of medicine, it's not just urology, but you always sort of start with a history and physical, you want to get the story, you want to get the details of whatever, you know, issues that they have. Um, I usually will kind of open up an appointment with what brings you in and tell me all about it, all the details of what's going on, because that helps you figure out what it could be, you know, what it could be and how you can fix it. Um, and then, of course, the physical, um, you know, you want to get an idea of if they have pain, where they have pain, if there are skin changes or lumps and bumps, things like that. So very important. Um, their medical family and social history. Um, so that can be very important to figuring out what's going on with the patient. Um, we like to get labs. So the big important labs for urology that, you know, if someone ever asked you, okay, what should we get for this patient? And it's a urological patient, you should just think about these four things. And, and one of them is probably right. So <laughs> creatinine is a measure of their kidney function. Uh, hematocrit is a measure of their blood levels. A urinalysis is basically analyzing what's in their urine. So you can find things like if there's uh, blood cells, if there are white blood cells, which can be a marker of infection or inflammation. Um, you can see if there's protein, which, you know, there's not supposed to be protein in your urine. So that can be a clue. Um, you can see if um, there's glucose or ketones that can be a sign of maybe diabetes or some other process going on. So very important. And then urine culture is kind of like the holy grail because a lot of the pathology we deal with, you know, we want to make sure it's not something as simple as a urine infection, which would be a much easier fix than, you know, proposing some surgery. So those are kind of the four big ones. And then uh, we like to get imaging. So um, a simple x-ray of the abdomen and pelvis will, you know, give us an idea. Sometimes we can figure out what's going on from that. Um, we love kidney bladder ultrasounds. We can see abnormal things or if things are dilated that are not supposed to be super helpful. Uh, CT scan, which is, you know, a bit more invasive because there's uh, x-ray exposure, but, um, you know, that is also kind of like the holy grail. We can see a lot of things. And then we do a bunch of other, you know, MRIs and things like that. But these are kind of the basic ones to help us with our workup initially. Um, and then continuing on in urology, you know, we have a lot of clinic tests that we can do. So it's nice to bring patients in um, because if they're complaining, for example, of urinary problems, we can have them sort of urinate into a little contraption that measures how fast they are urinating and how much and what's left over. And that can be very informative. So if you ever walk into a urology clinic and you go to the bathroom, sometimes you're like, I don't know how to use this toilet because there's a contraption over it. So <laughs> I have not infrequently gone in and been like, I will just find another bathroom because I don't know what's going on. Um, we have urodynamics. So that is a, a bit more invasive test, but that gives us some information about the bladder and how it's working, how it's functioning, um, if it's a safe bladder or unsafe bladder, so to speak. Um, and then cystoscopy, which is where we take a camera and look inside the bladder. So that is a procedure that we do in clinic all the time. And, um, you know, obviously can be very nerve wracking for patients. And, you know, you just kind of let them know it's a very quick thing. And it, they, they usually are more anxious. The anxiety is worse than the actual procedure. But that's just a example of some of the stuff that we do. And I will say with urology and um, one big change that's happened since COVID um, because we all know the world, you know, shut down kind of fast, but we still have to take care of patients. And so we switched a lot of our clinic appointments to being over Zoom or over telephone. And um, that has been like really great, I think, for everyone. Um, UCSF in particular is a, you know, um, it's a quaternary hospital, meaning that we see kind of the very, very, very complex stuff that the community hospitals can't deal with which makes sense. We have the resources and the training and all that stuff. But that means that sometimes patients are driving from three, four or five hours away to come to our clinic. 
and you can imagine and we've all been at the doctor I myself have sat around for hours just to be seen for 15 minutes and if you're driving four hours to have that happen it's you know that's not great. So um, a lot of our appointments we can do over the phone or over Zoom and save patients a drive. And you know, if we do that initial visit and we decide it's something that we need to see or we want to get some of these tests, then we can have them come in and it'll be, you know, worth their time and we want to be respectful of their time. So that has been really nice since COVID, one one nice thing that came out of it. Um, and then, you know, we always talk about um, surgical versus medical management, and this is a discussion with the patient. So we always aim to try to manage things medically if it's uh, effective and safe, and we'll usually kind of go through an algorithm and add things that we can. And, you know, if we get to a point where the medicines aren't working, then we talk about um, what surgeries need to be done. And some patients kind of want to get it dealt with and just kind of want to jump to surgery, which is fine as long as it's safe and other patients never want to do surgery, which is also fine. So a lot of um, shared decision-making we say in medicine to make sure that everyone is happy. Um, so I think I have time, a little bit of time. Um, so I was just going to go through quickly kind of, you know, how we think about patients and, how all of those things we talked about with workup, how we use them. So, um, you know, in our training, whenever we're learning from our attendings in sort of a formal setting, we often will get um, real patient prompts and questions. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through this with everybody. So we have patient BT, who I just made up. So this isn't a real patient. Uh, and he was referred for gross hematuria. So that's, he saw blood in his urine. So he is a 72 year old man. He's a former factory worker. He has a 40 pack year history. Now talk about what that means. And he started noticing blood in his urine on and off for the past three months. He doesn't have any pain when he sees the blood, no other symptoms, denies having any sort of trauma or accident associated. And this is the first time in his life he's ever seen blood in the urine. Um, this patient has a history of hypertension, diabetes. He had a prior heart attack, which is a MI, myocardial infarction. Uh, his surgery, he's only had one and it was a hernia repair when he was 64. In his social history, he smoked two packs a day for 20 years and he quit 15 years ago. So the pack year is basically just the number of packs times the year. So that's how we ended up with 40 pack years. Um, so we go into his medication. He, he's taking some medication for his hypertension and his diabetes. He takes baby aspirin just for some heart health. Um, family history, his mother had breast cancer, there's heart disease, but there's no history of any GU cancers, no kidney cancer, bladder cancer, prostate cancer. Um, we go into our exam, his vitals are normal. On physical exam, he's slightly obese, older male, but there's no GU abnormalities that we find. Um, we get his labs here. They look like they're they're pretty normal. So we have our creatinine, 1.1 is normal. His hematocrit's 35. It's maybe a little low, but not dangerously low. Um, we did a urinalysis. So we saw that there was blood on the urinalysis. And then we did a urine culture to make sure there's not an infection and it was negative. So this is just a little schematic of um, how we sort of think about hematuria. Now this one is for, it says for microscopic hematuria or gross hematuria. It's kind of more of a slam dunk. You know, if they have gross hematuria, we kind of do the most invasive thing, but uh, this is, you know, usually how we figure out what to do for a patient. And, you know, you can kind of have the schematic in front of you. I think when you go through it enough, you kind of memorize it in your head and you know that they're going to go one way or another. Um, but for this patient, like I said, you know, he would be in our high risk group, which would involve giving, doing the cystoscopy, which is the camera and the bladder and getting a CT urogram. So for these patients, if they are older, um, if they're smokers, so he was 40 pack year smoking history. If they have, you know, a high number of, of red blood cells in the UA history of gross hematuria. So he has a lot of reasons why he would be in this high risk group. But for example, if he is, or the, another patient was younger, you know, less than 50, never smoked, maybe the UA just showed a couple of red blood cells, 
um, we wouldn't be as concerned. And so we wouldn't do the invasive stuff. We would maybe just repeat the urinalysis in the six months or just get an ultrasound. So a little bit about me, when I was 19, I had a UA that showed blood and I got referred to a urologist and they were threatening to do this cystoscopy, but luckily they, they, they didn't do it. So I think if that had happened, I don't know if I would have, would be a urologist. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of the, um, you know, the, the way that we think about things because we want to be as least invasive as possible, um, but we don't want to miss anything important or big. Um, so just going through his sort of story again and highlighting the things that I would think about if I heard it that make me think he's high risk. So factory worker, um, we know that uh, that can put patients at risk for you know certain things. He's a smoker. Um, he denied pain. So this isn't uh, this is painless hematuria, which is different from painful hematuria, which might be associated with trauma or something. And again, his smoking history. Um, so for him, like I said, the next steps, we order a CT urogram because we want to make sure we see what's happening um, on the inside. And then we actually do a cystoscopy where we evaluate the bladder. Um, and then if we actually find something from there, we would talk about going to the operating room. Um, so this is just some pictures of, you know, a CT scan. And the one thing I didn't mention is, you know, just because it's gross hematuria, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's the worst thing ever. For this patient that I was talking about, my concern was cancer. So um, smoking is a risk factor for bladder cancer. Certain exposures, factory workers, you know, risk can is a, a risk factor for bladder cancer. And so for him, I want to do the more invasive thing to make sure we're not missing a bladder cancer. But these are examples of other reasons why someone could have blood in the urine. If they have a kidney stone, which is what's showing here, they could very well see blood. If they have bladder stones, they would see, you know, blood in their urine. Um, this is showing what a bladder cancer could look like on a CT scan. And um, this is just showing a picture of, you know, renal cysts. So there are a lot of reasons why they could be blood in the urine. You just want to do as, as much as necessary to make sure you're not missing something dangerous. So that's just kind of, you know, how we think about different uh, pathologies. Um, and so for this patient, you know, we take him to the operating room and we find this sort of coral looking structure, which is very typical for bladder cancer. And what we do is we basically remove it. So the nice thing about this surgery is that um, we, it's sort of, diagnostic and therapeutic in that we remove the whole thing and get rid of all of the visible cancer, but then we also are finding out at the same time what kind of cancer it is. Um, and that sort of guides how we treat it. And so we have these different types of tumors, low risk, intermediate, high risk, and that sort of determines what we do next for the patient. So urology is, is full of algorithms and full of, um, you know, steps and we do things that are based on guidelines um, and, and the guidelines come from research and studies and uh, things that help us treat patients safely. So I won't bore you to go, go through all that, but <laughs> that is just an example of, you know, what we do and how we think about patients. So I will stop sharing my, my screen. Okay. Wow. Thank you for the informative presentation. Um, I'm sure of all, um, most if not all of our members um, learn more about the urology specialty. <laughs> um, but now we're going to move on to this section and then we'll have a Q&A session. Sure. So, Victor? Um, so for this slide, it's for the advice and encouragement encouragement that you can give to any students right now who are also going through the same path or trying to also um, just go into medical school? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the biggest thing I thought of, if I could do it again, I would probably take more time off before going to medical school. And um, I feel like, you know, that's not what we hear. And that's not what, you know, undergrads here, they're told like, okay, you got to go to the next step, next step. Medical school will always be there. 
being a doctor will always be an option. There will always be jobs. So, you know, if you're not ready or you don't quite know, take the opportunity to just figure it out slowly, you know, um, you know, get experience, volunteer, become a scribe, do research and figure out if it's the best thing for you. Um, you know, once you kind of start on the medicine journey, it doesn't stop. Like, like I said, I'm like going on to the next thing, I'm interviewing to do the next thing and that'll be two years and then I got to get a job and it kind of feels like it's just going by. So take time, you know, make the decision, go back when you're ready. Don't feel rushed. Um, and you know, it, medicine will always be there. So that would be the one thing I would do again. <laughs> And, and then I think, you know, especially in light of having our match recently, um, obviously I'm on the other side of it, but 81% of people match, that means that what 19 people didn't or 19% didn't. So um, does it mean that the journey is over? It just means that you, you just got, you got to keep going and it may not happen this, the way you want. So I would say if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a surgeon, or if you want to be a PhD or whatever, it will happen, you know, as long as you put in the time and it's what you want to do, it will happen. There's going to be a lot of failures along the way. That's normal. Just stay calm and keep it moving. So I, you know, I definitely had my moments where I thought it wasn't going to happen and the world was over. And I remember taking the MCAT and I took it again and I got the same score and I had this like mental breakdown. And then I was like, all right, so what are we going to do to try to make my application better? So it will happen if you want it to happen. All right, I'm done rambling. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to take a picture, um, a group picture. So, and then we'll move on to the Q and A session. So um, if anyone wants to be in the picture, this will be uh, published on our website. And um, if anyone wants to be on our picture, please turn on your camera. I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so feel free to turn on your camera if you'd like to be in the picture. Wow. Oh my gosh, look at everyone. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna take the picture in three, two, one. Don't worry, I'll take like 10. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you hear that. Okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> I think I'm done. Okay, um, thank you guys for um, turning on cameras. Now we're gonna move on to the Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions for Mary, please um, put it in the chat or um, raise your hand and unmute. Um, but we'll give some time for everyone to write down their questions, but we'll start get started with our questions, our first question. So my question is, um, so I ask this to every guest speaker who I invite um, because it's a very like relevant thing. Um, how do you manage burnout and how do you like combat that? Like there are times where you feel like um, I can't do this anymore and stuff like that, right? How do you combat that? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I feel like it's, um... It's something that you still figure out even till this day as a resident, you, you experience a lot of burnout. I think you have to, um, one, like forgive yourself when you have those feelings. I think you feel burnout and you feel guilty that you're having to burn out and then you have anxiety about feeling guilty and it goes on and on and on. I think first, just realizing that that's normal and sometimes you just got to lean into the burnout. So if that means that you're not going to study for that night, then you put things down for that night. If it means you're not going to hang out with friends or do things, just like take the time that you need to just relax and be in the burnout. But at the same time, you don't want to stay there. So you kind of want to set limits and say, okay, for tonight, I'm not going to do anything, but tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go at it. Um, I think the other thing is just like finding something, a hobby or anything that you enjoy outside of the work that you're doing to just 
focus some time to. Um, like I, I got into plants like with COVID, I think like a lot of people, cause you're kind of stuck in your apartment and it genuinely brings me a lot of joy and peace of mind. Like I look forward to just like throwing my bag down when I get home and like watering my plants and seeing what's popping up and I get really excited. So it can be something like that. It could be puzzles. Like my co-residents are like super into puzzles. I was like, oh, that's, that's new. Didn't know that was a thing, but you know, like puzzles or something that just gets your mind totally off of the work you're doing can help tremendously. So I think those are kind of the main things to, to deal with burnout. Thank you, because um, me and my like my other friends, we all struggle with right now. And hearing from someone who has experienced it over and over again and tips like that is very useful. Um, and I, do you have like a corner dedicated to your plants or is it just like scattered around your apartment? Um yeah, it started as a corner and now it's uh, over my entire apartment. So my, my whole apartment is like my little oasis. Um, but yeah, it's there, you know, it's my bathroom, my bedroom, like my kitchen. I'm looking at a plant right here in front of me. <laughs> so they're, they're just kind of everywhere, but you know, it's cool. It's, you know, something totally different from medicine that I can also, you know, sort of dedicate some time to, and it's nice to sort of take that break. Um, and we, um, have another question in the chat, um, where someone asks, is doing analysis like the smoker example, does that happen often? Um, that's a great question. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's kind of a part of a yearly checkup. Like when you go to the doctor, they check certain things, but it's, it depends on like the age group. So, uh, I think we tend to check in older patients. We'll check a urinalysis because, you know, it's not just a way of picking up blood. It, like I said, all the other stuff, if you have glucose or proteins, things that can signal up another problem. Um, you can always ask for a urinalysis, although I feel like at your age and my age, it's, I would not worry about it. So <laughs> um, bladder cancer and, and most cancers are diseases of just being older. So typically we, we will look for it in older patients. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question is, what would it, what would your second specialty be if it wasn't urology? Uh, good question. Um, you know, I still don't really know. <laughs> I think I'm just so grateful that I found urology because it's a great fit. Um, but I think it would probably be something else surgical. Um, ENT, ear, nose, and throat. You know, they do surgeries of the face and the ear, nose, and throat. <laughs> um, and it's a similar sort of lifestyle. And the people seem to be, you know, also similarly chill and, you know, great people to work with. So potentially that, but I'll just say I'm lucky that I I, I love urology because it's definitely where I belong. Um, so I also have a question. So from undergrad to med school, did your study habit change at all? And how were you able to um, balance um, just having a life in general, like during med school, while also just studying and preparing for like exams? Yeah. Um, so my study habits did change. They, I would say they kind of evolved. Um, I think um, I had pretty good study habits in college and the years off were great because when I came to med school, I was like, I knew it was going to be very intensive and I was ready for that. Um, and I, I was one who like, you know, a lot of friends would kind of go to the library, study together. And I knew that I, that didn't work for me. So I, I would spend whole weekends in my room, in my apartment studying because that's what I needed to do. Um, but I will say, you know, we, in, in med school, you say you, you work hard and you play hard. So like, yeah, I would spend a whole weekend in my room studying, but then once the exam was done, you know, you're with friends, you're hanging out, you're going out, whatever you want to do. Um, and it really was like a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun because, you know, you're just all in it together. So um, you definitely find a balance and it gets easier as you go along, even with residency. You know, when I started as an intern, it was really hard to find the balance and it's been a lot easier now where, you know, when I'm not in the hospital, I take advantage and I do the things that I want to do. Thank you. Um, and we have a question in the chat that asks, what is the work-life balance as a urologist? Is it a nine-to-five job? 
Um, it is not. So um, it is more of a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. job. <laughs> um, and as a resident, it's maybe 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. So it, it's, a, it's a lot of hours. Um, and if you think about, you know, just being a surgeon, you are starting to operate at 730 in the morning and you're not done until six o'clock and you get there for the patients are actually ready to go and you're maybe seeing patients after. And honestly, there, there aren't many specialties where it really is nine to five. It, there may be a few, but most of them are going to be closer to, you know, 10 to 12 hours. Um, so it's, it's definitely long days. And adding to that question, how do you think, um, how is it, is it easy to balance both work and your social life? Yeah, I mean, luckily, um, the way that our sort of job is set up is, is when you're working, you know, when you're in a hospital, you're working, but usually when you are not in the hospital, you're off. So, um, you know, if we're not working for the weekend, you get the whole weekend off and you don't have to worry about any of work. Um, and so you find the balance. I, I think it gets easier as you um, go through training and you become more efficient. I mean, just learning how to take care of patients can make your day longer. But when you've gone through it so often, you know, you know how to get things done quickly and how to document quickly. And when you leave the hospital, you're like, I'm going to go to dinner. I'm going to go to the movies. I'm going to do whatever. So um, you start to take those chances more. You're a little bit like more nervous about it when you're an intern or you know, more junior. Um, so you, you, I mean, I look at my attendings who are kind of, you know, they're the ones who finish their training. They're the, the top doctors, top surgeons. They all seem very happy with their, their lives. You know, they have families, they finish operating, they go see their families, they go on vacation, they're going to their kids' games, all that stuff. So you can definitely find that balance. Thank you. Um, and another question is, what are some good experiences slash opportunities to be involved if I'm interested in being a physician? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you can never um, overshadow. I think if you know people or if you have a way to find um, people who, who will let you shadow, just try to shadow in the hospital. It's it's something that gets you exposure to patient care, but it's also something that you can talk about when you're kind of going through the interview process later on for med school. It's something you can write about um, and it's something to put on your um, your resume. So shadowing is always great. Um, I think a lot of, of students when they are trying to you know beef up their application will be a scribe. Um, and that's a great way of um, getting exposure to medical terms and medical conditions. And, you know, in our clinic, we have scribes and a lot of the scribes are going into medical school and they're just so familiar with the workup of patients. You know, that's something that can help you along the way. Um, definitely research. I mean, um, UCSF, I, I'm in a lab and our lab is full of techs who are in the position of applying for med school and you get excellent exposure. You're working directly with, you know, an attending physician, resident, I'm around and offer advice or whatever they need. So research, whether, you know, it's more locally or if you can go to um, a institution that has a research program. And then definitely in the NIH um, post back program, remember that, keep that in mind. It's it's an opportunity that people apply to from all over the country. You don't just have to be, you know, in that region. And that that can really go a long way. It's great exposure and it, it looks really great just, you know, when you have that that background. Um, and this is my question, um, but do you like San Francisco better, New Jersey better or um, Maryland better? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, you know, I am definitely a Baltimore girl. Um, and I see myself probably ending up back there just because my family is all there. Um, but I cannot stress how much I hate snow, um, even though I grew up with it. So San Francisco and California is looking very appealing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a little tough. So I am, uh, 
not trying to get back to Maryland too quickly because I, I just, I really hate snow and um, yeah. So, but no, I mean, San Francisco is, is different. You know, I was just talking to a friend about this, the access to nature, to the beach. I can see the ocean from my apartment. You can drive like not very far to be surrounded by forest and redwood trees and all these things. So um it's it's uh it's great san francisco is growing on me even though i am really an east coast person it's growing on me <laughs> thank you um and we have a question in the chat um if you don't get a very high mcat score what do you suggest to do to make yourself still look like a good applicant uh yeah i think um well one thing is you can you know take the MCAT over and over again. Um, some people take it three times, that's okay. I think the most important thing is you wanna show that you've improved from one test to the other. Um, so in my experience, I got the exact same score, which was like so annoying, but I had improved in one section that I was really focusing on. Um, and so that's what people looked at. They said, oh, your your physics section went up. And it was like, yeah, I, I spent months focusing on that. So, um, but you know, I think, all those experience that I sort of mentioned, the the volunteering or shadowing, the research, all that stuff goes a long way. I think if you can um, talk about why you want to be a doctor in a way that goes beyond like, I just want to help people because, you know, you can help people and be a firefighter. You can help people and, you know, be a nurse. So you want to say why you want to be a doctor, having those experiences will help um, and sometimes that, you know, if you don't get the MCAT score that you think you want, it means maybe taking extra time off so that you make sure that you have those experiences. And like I said, being a doctor, medicine isn't going anywhere. So take whatever time you need to be the best applicant you can. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have another question in the chat. Um, do you have any tips for memorization? Because one needs to, uh, continuously take in new information daily. So how did you manage it? I'm assuming for the MCAT and medical school. Yeah, I would say, you know, you, you there's always a continuous stream of information <laughs> that you're memorizing. Uh, that's a good question. I don't necessarily see myself as being like great at memorizing things. And, and honestly, um, once you get to like the med school resident part, you're not really memorizing, you're, you're understanding um, concepts, you're understanding why something is happening a, a certain way. So if you feel like you have to memorize it, that means maybe you don't really understand it. And so you need to focus on like what you can do to understand the process as opposed to memorizing. But you know, when it does come to memorizing, because now I'm thinking about like Krebs cycle and all that stuff that I can do memorize, <laughs> the worst. Um, I personally learned or studied by writing things down. So, you know, I would take my notes during the lecture and I would almost rewrite my entire notes when I studied for the exam. Um, I also would say things out, out loud and that also sort of helped solidify it. So um, part of it is figuring out what works for you. That is also the reason why I didn't study it in the libraries because I talked to myself out loud. So it just did not work for me. Um, so, it is, um, yeah, it's all about figuring out kind of what works best for you. But th those were kind of the things I did. And I have another question. Um, were you always pre-med or, and if you had to do it again, would you still go into medicine? Um, yeah, I, I was always pre-med, um, which at least for Gettysburg wasn't like, that different from anything else. Um, you know, it was just the same classes that I was taking for my biology major and maybe a few extra ones. Um, but I think, you know, at maybe bigger uh, universities, pre-med track means like a very different thing. Um, the nice thing is that, you know, if you decide late that you want to go into medicine and you weren't doing that track, there are um, programs after medical or after undergrad where you can kind of get those classes. It's, it's a post-bac, but sort of different from the post-bac I did. 
And you can kind of make up those classes if you need to. Some people will, you know, get a master's in something to make themselves look, you know, like a better applicant. That's also another way to kind of beef up your your um, resume when applying med school. You can get like a master's in something and show that, you know, you are smart and you can learn things and that's important. Um, so yeah, that is that. And then would I do it over again? Um, I mean, I think this is truly what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> I definitely have my moments where I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, I have classmates from college that have been working for 10 years and make who knows how much and are moving on with their lives. But um, I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I truly find a lot of joy in doing it. And I really love working with patients and I love being their doctor and the reassurance and all that stuff. So um, I would do it again, even if, you know, I'm dragging my feet saying it, I know that I would. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Was there ever like a specialty that was immediately like a no for you, like just throughout medical school? Um, definitely. I don't want to like, you know, down talk any specialties, but for me personally, I knew that I didn't want to do, um, internal medicine, which is a huge one. Like most people go into internal medicine, but once I had this realization that I liked doing surgery, it was like, well, I'm not going to do internal medicine because it's like the opposite of surgery. Um, you know, I, thought I was going to do pediatrics for the longest time, which is why I decided on urology so late. And then when I finally did my pediatric rotation, I realized that it maybe was not for me. <laughs> um, and, you know, pediatricians are great and it wasn't even, you know, the, the kids are great. The parents were fine. It just wasn't a good fit for me. And it was more about the personalities in it um, and the people. And I just didn't see myself maybe fitting in as well there. So um you know, that was one, but big respect to all the pediatricians out there. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, I was, I was pretty open-minded going through the process or I tried to be. Um, so another question that I have was that, um, have you ever had a friends or like family member ask you to like diagnose them or like just, um, ask you, ask you about their medical, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, history. Yeah, you guys, you know, if, if you go down this route, you will definitely get those questions. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of exciting and at first when you're like a med student and people are like, oh, doc, this and that. And you're like, oh, my God. Um, but then you're like, you're like, OK, well, I don't you know, I'm getting so specialized in what I'm doing. I'm like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you have to talk to your doctor. Um, but, you know, honestly, I have like a funny story is I, I used to work um, at a restaurant in Baltimore. And, um, you know, was friends on social media with one of the people I worked with and hadn't worked there for a long time. And he know, knew that I was a urologist and he reached out to me about something urological that was going on with him. And, you know, it was, it was fine. I put on my urology shoes and, you know, wasn't like, oh my God, why are you telling me this? It was like, I'm happy to answer whatever questions and kind of felt nice that he trusted me, even though I hadn't talked to him in a long time, he trusted me enough to kind of you know, have that, that problem and come to me about it. So it definitely happens. And, um, it, it, you know, it feels good sometimes, sometimes you're just like, I don't know, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so. Um, so we have another question uh, in the chat asking, do you need to know what specialty you want to go in before you apply to for medical school? Definitely not. And it's almost better if you don't know. Um, I think some people go in thinking they want to do something maybe because they have family members who do it or they think it's cool. And um, you just want to go open minded. Like you want to just take it all in and figure out what works best for you because you don't want to end up down the road, you know, years later realizing that you don't enjoy it. And that happens. And there are residents who switch, you know, tracks and it's possible. But as you can imagine, it's a little bit of lost time and a little bit tough to do. So I would just be open minded um, and, you know, just take it all in and learn from the experiences you have. Thank you. Um, and I have another question regarding um, uh, financial aid and cost of attendance. Mm -hmm. So as you all know, medical school is expensive. So mm -hmm. um, how did you 
um, manage your expenses with the location you chose because I'm I'm sure out of state is more expensive, is it? Yeah. And um, was that like a factor in your decisions? Yeah, great question. Um, medical school is definitely expensive. Um, I have some loans that are sitting there waiting for me to pay them and, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you can go to um, kind of a public or a private medical school. There's no difference really in the education. We all end up learning the same thing and we all end up taking the same standardized test. Um, so I went to Rutgers and I technically was out of state, but they had a, an option where if I got a, a New Jersey address before I started, then I could get in-state. So I ended up getting in-state tuition at Rutgers, which was super nice. Um, it saved me some money, but I still definitely have hefty loans. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are, um, there are options, you know, I, I actually had gotten a little bit of financial aid or like a little scholarship from another, um, med school that I got into, but I wanted to go to Rutgers, um, for the reasons that I mentioned before. Um, and then when you're there, I mean, it, it's a bit of learning to manage your finances because you kind of get like a lump sum of the loan as a, maybe some people have experience with and you have to make it last. So, um, you know, I think for me, I just made sure I had enough for my bills to get paid, my rent to get paid. Um, I, I didn't really use that money to go crazy for anything. I, I, chose an amount to borrow that I thought was just necessary for me to pay the bills that I needed to. And, you know, anything else that I wanted, I, I had my own sort of money saved that I would use for that stuff. So, um, but you know, if, when you go through the process, if there are scholarships or anything that you can apply for, for extra help, definitely look into it because, you know, the loans are definitely, it's real. So um, you want to get all the help that you can. Um, and we have another question in the chat asking, what are the pros and cons of specializing in neurology? Oh, um, I would say the pros are um, all the different operations that we get to do. Um, it's very diverse. We, you know, operate like you kind of think about a surgeon cutting open the belly and operating. We operate with a robot where we are sitting at a console across the room and using the robot to do these fine movements. We operate with the microscope where you're literally looking through a microscope and having to do very, very fine movements. Um, a lot of our surgeries don't involve any cutting at all. We go through the urinary system. So we have a, it's kind of like the um, gastroenterologist. They take a little camera and they go down your esophagus. They don't have to cut anything on the outside. We do that, but we're going through your urinary system. So maybe not the most pleasant to think about, but it's nice if you don't have any cuts on your body. So we have a lot of different ways we can do surgery, um, which means there's, you know, a ton of learning and residency, but it's good for me because, you know, I get bored easily. So I find that I'm never bored. There's always a skill for me to learn. Um, the cons of urology, I don't know. I mean, it's long. The training is long. Five to six years is a lot. Um, but, you know, we say the days are long, the years are short because it. I can't believe that I'm almost at the end of this. Like, it, <laughs> I feel like I just started. So, um, yeah, that's probably one thing, but you kind of get through it. Um, and there's another question in the chat. Um, what qualities would you say would make someone a great urologist? Example of given being detail-oriented, multitasking, et cetera. Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, yeah, detail-oriented, multitasking is probably just the skills to be a good doctor in general. You have to do that in everything. Um, I would say in urology, you definitely have to like not take things too seriously. Like at the end of the day, the specialty is just funny. It's just funny what we do and where we work. And so if you're taking things too seriously, like you're just, you just, it's fine. It's all fine. We're all laughing. Um, not at patients, but at ourselves. Um, I would say if you, um, I don't know, urology is cool because we have a lot of tools that we use. We work with wires and 
dilators and things like that. And so you almost have to be creative in how you deal with uh, problems. Um, there are some ways, in some ways we do the same thing every time. In other ways, you have to get creative on how to solve an issue. So uh, if you kind of like thinking outside the box or getting creative, um, working with wires, working with, you know, different things, it's, it's a good specialty. Um, and it's not, you know, we don't, it's not the traditional surgery, like I was saying that you think of. And so, um, I don't know, be good for, for that type of person who's, who can adjust and adapt and be creative. Okay. And we have another question in the chat asking, do you work with PAs and NPs in the clinic? If yes, how is the patient care collaboration like? Yeah, so we definitely do um, our APPs, advanced, pra advanced practice. I forget what the other P is, but yes, PAs and NPs. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they're they're everywhere, and it's definitely becoming more common. And it's great working with them because, um, at least as a resident, you know, they kind of help us get through the day and do some of the tasks that we do. Um, so we have APPs that are on the inpatient side, so taking care of patients in the hospital. We have APPs that are on the outpatient side that are doing more clinic stuff. Um, you know, they are excellent. They can, you know, some of them have their own clinic that they, they run by the attending. If they have questions, they can do procedures. Um, you know, it, it's great working with them and it, it, we appreciate, you know, the work that they do and yeah, it's a great, great, uh, sort of collaborative effort to take care of patients. <laughs> And there's another question asking, do you plan on working in an academic or private setting after the fellowship? Um, I am probably going to stay academic. Um, that's a good question. I think my sort of goal is to continue working with um, patients who are underserved, uninsured, vulnerable, um, and you know, I'm not sure that you really get that access if you're private practice because you kind of need to be insured. So, so um, I think, you know, with the research that I'm doing and what I want to focus on, I want to provide that care to the patients who maybe need it the most or at least don't have as, as best access. So I definitely want to stay academic. And I like, you know, teaching, uh, you know, I'm getting more into that role as I'm more senior and taking junior residents through the surgery and doing stuff like this. And so I kind of, I want to continue these efforts for sure. And there's another question asking, what made you pick oncology for the fellowship? Um, yeah, a lot of different reasons. Um, so I think we probably use, operate with the robot the most in oncology. I really do love operating with the robot. It's pretty cool. Um, the pathology is awesome. We, we have so many different surgeries that we do, and that is kind of one of the sub sub specialties of urology where it is like the same way every time. Um, and I have an attending who says that all the time, and it is important because it can get you out of a lot of, uh, struggles. So if things don't look, you know, the same, because not every patient looks the same, you kind of use the same um, techniques and landmarks and things. And, and that kind of helps get you out of a bind. Um, and then of course there's, you know, the patients that you're taking care of. Um, not every surgery is going to go perfectly. You're not going to be able to cure every patient, but um, patients appreciate that you tried and patients appreciate that you gave them more time if that's what you did, or if you did cure them. And that population, I just, you know, it's gratifying to work with them and um, to provide, you know, to say that I'm their doctor and that I'm going to be the one taking care of them. And, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, I feel like one of the tougher subspecialties of urology because with big surgeries come big complications and we definitely always deal with complications every now and then. But I think I just, you know, I want to take care of those patients. So that's, that's why I chose it. And we have another question um, asking, do you have any physicians in your family that may have influenced your desire to pursue the field? 
Um, great question. I don't have any physicians in my family, so I am the first. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, there's a few nurses, um, you know, some, some of my mom's cousins, but really no one has been in, in medicine. So I am the first. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, um, have you ever, have you always been like since high school, like, oh, I want to be a doctor instead of like the other professions in the health field? Yeah, um, I didn't always know I wanted to be a doctor. I think I always had an affinity towards science. I loved all the sciences. Um, I think I got a good exposure to kind of anatomy and physiology in high school and certainly in college. And I found that I was fascinated with how the body works and learning that, you know, learning just little basic things, how a muscle contracts. So, you know, I was like, dang, that's cool. <laughs> so I think it kind of just came together that that, you know, I was fascinated by it. And there's this career where I can learn all that and I can use all that and take care of people. And I've always considered myself to be a people person. And, you know, um, I'm really good at reading people and I love interacting with people. And so it just kind of worked right science body people so <laughs> so yeah but I definitely figured it out later um and we have another question um did you apply to any DO medical programs and if you did should students consider applying to DO medical programs in addition to MD programs to maximize their chances of becoming a physician yeah, you know, I personally did not apply to DO schools. Um, I think traditionally it was thought that a DO school you apply to as like a backup, but I think that mentality is changing. And while MD and DOs end up at the same place, you know, end up at the same hospitals, um, I think the way they think about medicine and the body is slightly different. It's more um, homeopathic, I think that's the right word, or whole holistic is the better word for DO. Um, and so I think it's better to think about what might work for you. Like I would, I would recommend looking up the different philosophies of MD versus DO um, and deciding if one sounds better for you. I wouldn't think about it as like a backup. I think um, you certainly can apply to both if you find, you know, schools that you think fit, or maybe you're interested in both, but you know, you go, you, you do what sounds like it'll work for your learning style and for your, how, you know, the type of physician that you want to be. At the end of the day, you were all doctors. So, yeah. And I want to give a gentle reminder, if you guys have any last minute questions, we'll wrap this up in a few minutes. But if you have any last minute questions, just feel free to drop in the chat or raise your hand and we can tell you to unmute. But um, the next question is, <clears throat> what is your most unforgettable experience in the journey of becoming a urology surgeon? Ooh, unforgettable experience. Ooh, okay. Well, <laughs> when I was a fourth year, um, medical student and I was, you know, going through this process of applying for residency, um, I was at one of our hospitals that we rotate uh, with Rutgers. So I was still at kind of my home institution and it was at one of the hospitals that was very busy. And I mean, they operated from 6.30 in the morning to six o'clock at night. And it was a really busy week for me. And I got towards the end of the week and I was obviously tired. And one of the attendings, you know, said, oh, we have this really cool case we're doing tomorrow as in Saturday, you should come by. And I just was like, Oh my God. <laughs> because you, if the attending invites you to a Saturday operation, you go to the Saturday operation. Um, so I got up on Saturday and went to the hospital and showed up and he said, Oh my God, you actually showed up. And I said, what? <laughs> of course I showed up. Remember that if they tell you to show up, show up. Apparently some people don't. And it was the coolest case I have ever seen. I think in retrospect, it must have been some really large kidney cancer. I actually don't know, but the plan was to do the surgery um, with a robot because they used a robot a lot. But this 
tumor was so large that there wasn't in any room for us to use the instruments in there. So we ended up having to just do traditional surgery and making a big incision. And this thing was ginormous. It was probably the size of like a hefty turkey that came out of this woman's body. And I got a picture with it and put it on social media. And, you know, it was cool. It was just kind of like, you know, multiple things happened. I got to be involved in a really cool surgery. Um, and then I just, I made a good impression on an attending who ultimately maybe had a say in, you know, how I did for that rotation. And so take, take every opportunity, honestly. And, you know, if somebody tells you to show up, show up. If someone asks you to show up, show up. Um, but it was really cool. <laughs> so that was a moment where I was like, yeah, this is, I think this is definitely what I want to do. Like just the excitement of being there. Um, and we have another question in the chat asking, how do other residents and attendings view students who went to Caribbean medical schools? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, well, the Caribbean medical school schools are, are um, for one thing, they are for profit. Um, and so it's thought of as kind of a safety type of thing that if you can't get into the school, into a school in the US, then you can go to those universities because, you know, obviously, well, they're making money. At the end of the day, it's still a medical school. You still have a degree. You still go through the same match process. And there are plenty of people who are in training, who are working, who have gone to the Caribbean schools. And so I don't think it is a reason or something that holds people back. Um, I think once you get there, if that's, you know, where you end up going, you work your butt off, you learn everything you can, because you're going to take the same standardized test that the person who goes to Yale or Harvard does. And if you do better on that test, it, you know, it, it doesn't truly matter like where you went to, to school. Obviously, you know, you, you're going to apply for residency and they look at that information. But I think the reason that we have these sort of standardized tests is to truly sort of standardize things. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, there's nothing wrong with it, but they, they're a slightly different sort of um, motivation because they are, you know, you pay a lot of money to go there. It's, it's a for-profit thing as opposed to some of the other medical schools, so. Thank you. And there's just one last question. Um, someone asked, um, could you please explain why uh, you went to, you decided to become a doctor? Um, because I'm currently uh, interested in the profession, but I just don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I, so I think, um, you know, like I mentioned before, just genuinely being interested in learning, um, about the body and medicine and all that stuff. I would say why I thought a doctor as opposed to like a PA or an NP. Um, while PAs and NPs can do a lot that doctors do, um, ultimately the doctor is responsible. Um, you know, if, if they can't do something or they don't know how to, it's up to the doctor to get it done. Um, and I just knew that I wanted that responsibility. Um, and not to say that people who get NPs or PAs are avoiding responsibility. They just may have different goals. For me, I wanted to be the person, the last stop that people went to, the person that had had to have the answers because it was up to me. And I wanted to um, be that person for patients and be that person for trainees and be that person for APPs. And so um, you have to know like the most in the room, the most about the patient. And I was up for that challenge. So, um, I think that's why I decided doctor as opposed to another sort of health profession. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's 526. So we're going to wrap up this meeting. Um, and So again, <laughs> the word of the day today is hematuria, which is um, blood in the urine, <laughs> like um, Mary um, had in her presentation. And the sign out sheet is in the chat if you would like to earn one MOA point and 
the MOI points is to um, um, indicate your active member status and more information can be read in our points document. Um, but yeah, so please, uh, if you would like to earn a point, please um, enter this word in the document that we just sent. Um, and can we give a big thank you to Mary for coming in today um, to share her story and basically um, help us learn more about um, the, the medical field and the urology um, specialty. Um, because especially since we're a community college who like, we're just starting our like first two years of undergrad, so lower division requirements. A lot of us are navigating um, what we want to do. So hopefully some of you guys might be urologists in the future. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming in today. And um, everyone, spam hearts or like <laughs> reactions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Okay, nice to meet you all. Good luck with everything. And I definitely hope to see some future urologists, you know? <laughs> okay, stop. I'm going to stop this recording. <laughs>